Hello, Ray. How are you doing? Hi. Well, I'm I'm doing quite well. I had a bit of a hiccup, as you know. We, our whole family had a bout of stomach flu. And living up in a little country home, we've got a loft that we all sleep together. So two kids, my wife and I, and uh, four days of poor sleep. But I'm back at it. Today's the first day I'm starting to feel a bit more energized, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Yeah, me too. I've been really looking forward to it because and and well done for getting through that travail because it's quite intense with four of you. I'm I'm impressed. Well done. Double double thumbs up. <laughs> you you're here tonight. Um oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we we met on Zoom. So it's it's just um it's nice to reconnect over Zoom. So when we met, we met through the world of dowsing and earth energy and mm. you said something and my radar started going woo, 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 when you talked about something that i'm just mm. currently reading about and um it it's very cosmic and as above so below as within so without the sort of metic principles and so we know each other through the dowsing world. I, I would love for you to explain a little bit about who you are, how you're here, you know, what 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 you're about. Can you can you start by telling us about that? Sure. Um well I I am at this phase of my life, I have a farmer who a nutritionist gone farmer, and now I'm a farmer gone homesteader. Um, developing gardens and focusing on the magic of electroculture. And this has been a primary focus of mine for a while now, many years, is electroculture is the use of, of harmonizing, attracting, energizing plants, ecosystems, microorganisms through the use of electricity and magnetism. And my main interest, though, outside of this, is focusing on the peripheries of that and going more into the subtle energies. Um, and it's very appropriate for, I think, your audience, because I think many of your listeners can relate um, to more of the, the peripheries. Um, but I, I co-run a Facebook community and um, of many active participants who are exploring electroculture and various techniques and technologies um, within that scope. Mm -hmm. And my primary focus in the physical world, which is most of my life, is out in the garden and growing things and designing gardens in a way that harmonize with, going back to what you were speaking of, is earth energies, cosmic energies, um, mirroring different unseen forces um, in the way I design gardens. And the results are amazing. I, I'm seeing vitality and growth in plants, and resistance to disease. And it's not miraculous, but I'm seeing things that, that have only just woken up inside of me after... 10 plus years of farming professionally to then see that there's a lot more than just sound horticultural practices um, and understanding that there's more than that and environmental factors like sun, water, et cetera. There's this whole other dimension and that's what's really starting to light me up. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you so much, Ray. Because yes, electroculture is, is something that might be new to quite a few people yet it's not new on the earth it's been I've, I've been listening to your podcast mm. and it's fascinating that there's this real history there so exploring and experimenting with electricity and magnets to enhance and help plants flourish to be the best that they can be right from the teeny tiny seed before they've sprouted all the way through to like you, you know you and I've discussed this sort of the mm. vitality 
and the vibrancy, the more intense flavors, the more intense green, mm. let's say if you're growing kale or cabbage, and then the bountiful nature of it. So it it's 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 like it's a natural support. And and there's a lot of scientific research behind it too. It's 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 not, you know, let's say yeah. so an it's still, it's still just starting to enter the zeitgeist in certain circles. And I think most people are very skeptical um, at surface level or looking at it and thinking, you know, this is nuts. Um, how can this be? How could it not be present in agricultural sciences as a whole? Although mm -hmm. there, are, there are some um, researchers and countries that are putting more energy into it, like China, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but this this technology has been around for thousands of years. It's not it's not something that it goes beyond the name actually back to ancient times. And that's really what gets me most excite, excited about it is more of the ancient elements of it. It's not the laboratory experimental, you know, use of artificial electrical currents or magnetic fields. It's how to harmonize with existing electromagnetic forces mm. how to understand them how to redirect them amplify them in a way that is going to facilitate life yeah and it opens up this whole other perception of reality and and for me that's what gets me really excited is because there's this there's this wonder that comes out when experimenting with certain techniques and then suddenly you can see oh my gosh, there's a whole world of things that I never knew existed. And most people have, even experts in academia, have no idea horticultural sciences of any of this stuff. And I'm going, how much more is out there at our fingertips <laughs> that we can use that, and experiment with that, you know, practically? Yeah, that's, you know, and it, I it's, feel it. <laughs> I can feel it when you say this, Ray, it's like, Wow. And and the our, our ancients, you know, the ancestors, they knew this stuff more instinctively, let's say, or in, intuitively, mm. you know, and, and um, we were talking uh, um, previously a little bit about Patrick McManaway, who's an mm. amazing dowser who's he's grown up in the UK. He's based a lot in, in the US nowadays, I think. And he still builds and designs with geomancy, with earth energy, um, stone circles. And he's done a lot of evaluation and studying of them over many, many moons. And he's found mm. that they act like a giant battery. Mm. So when you put your stones in a particular it's not always a literal circle either. It's almost like a slight elliptical circle. And you mm. put certain stones with certain frequencies and resonance in a particular order. You can mm -hmm. put your sack of grain that you want to charge up for that season's growth. If the intention for that stone circle has originally been conceived as something to help with the, the fruits of the earth and growing, you know, each stone circle can have a particular intention. So it's about co-creating again with that consciousness and awareness and and connection with the earth and and it does create a much greater yield much greater opportunity for sprouting in the first instances for those seeds um but yeah. it's like we're we're re-remembering and yeah we we're re-remembering this is this is yeah. um this is fundamentally prehistoric you know this is the emergence of agriculture you know, we, we see that stone circles began to emerge right around the transition from hunter-gatherers to uh, the Neolithic era, but their people were still nomadic, you know, generally speaking, we're still moving around in groups mm -hmm. and we're, we're cultivating food, um, less domestication of animals, but we're, we're working with predominantly grains and grasses. Mm -hmm. And they would have observed many of these phenomena. And this is the part that I find amazing is this technology 
continued up until the Green Revolution in stone circles in the UK, such as Stonehenge, where old farmers would bring their seed up until, even up until the 70s, and would charge their seeds ritualistically during important moments, wow. minutes, you know, where they're, whether an equinox or solstice, and would charge their seeds. And the result was greater fertility. Mm. And th this is, this isn't just stone circles, megaliths. It's also pyramids, you know, going back to the Almex, pre-Mayan, Mesoamerica, yeah. It's the step pyramids, the, the peak at the top. There is a change in the electrostatic field between the earth and the atmosphere as you rise further up. Okay? Wow. You get more charge. There's more voltage per square meter electricity. Is this whether you're going up in general or if you're going up? on a step pyramid? Well, the, in general, this is the case. Okay. When you're going up a step pyramid, you'll look and you'll see that a lot of these ancient pyramids and megaliths in general were built with very specific stones, often highly paramagnetic stones. Mm. Basalt, which is igneous rocks, rock that the volcanoes have ejected, you know? Mm -hmm. Granite as well, which is extremely, extremely difficult to work with. And you know, the Egyptians carved really out hard. massive obelisks, you know, yeah. solid granite. Yeah. And the paramagnetism is a phenomena in which when you have a magnetic field, the molecules within a paramagnetic substance, they align themselves with that magnetic field temporarily. Okay. When that magnetic field is gone, it changes. And many of these ancient sites and monuments, as you know, and perhaps many of your listeners do also, many of these sites are deemed sacred. And I think that's a very appropriate word Mm. When you see the results of being in these spaces, mm. uh, human consciousness, vitality in ecosystems and in plants, there's always associations to fertility gods, mm. goddesses. Yeah. Um, changes in water and how water functions as well. So all of these points, they come back to that a lot of these sites they are nodule points that are attracting electromagnetic energy in various ways. Whether that's telluric currents in the earth that are literally pulsing electricity, I mean, very small amounts, mm. but it's funneling through. And then where you have below many of these sites, you have these conductivity discontinuity layers in the geological strata right okay. and this creates a um, resistance that then forces see this is the thing is mag, mag magnetism runs perpendicular magnetic fields are perpendicular so if um, you have electrical currents that are running in a horizontal plane the magnetic fields are going to run vertical. Okay. Yeah. Right. Got it. And when you have many of these points, they align them with stellar bodies because there is this relationship between energy as it's moving, that when it, when it aligns at certain moments, like a lock and key principle, there is communication occurring at a distance. And this means that you can redirect energy that's naturally occurring for various purposes. And it has to do with geometry. It has to do with the, the, the angles and the precision 
Uh, mm -hmm. We see often the Fibonacci sequence encoded in the geometry, whether that's the Giza pyramids, that 51 um, degrees or 42, depending on which angle you're looking, or whether that's um, with the Nubian pyramids in, um, in Upper Egypt, which is modern yeah. Sudan, that's 72 degrees. There are these layers of geometry that mirror the cosmos. And the step energy means the energy is rising up the pyramid because it's north, there'll be the north face. Yeah. And it rises up to the altar at which there is this, um, the earth kissing the sun, so to speak, right? The union of opposites, the polarity. And when you have two intersecting circles of polarity that point of intersection is the creativity point it's where life emerges and i think you know from a symbolic standpoint that's what we're seeing you know there are many electrochemical phenomena at play that are well understood um, with seed epigenetics and pre-charging and there are researchers like uh, burke and halberg um, who wrote a book on this very topic of ancient agriculture and the use of their hypothesis of pyramids and megalithic sites charging seeds. And they documented through various devices, electrostatic voltmeters. Um, they were able to, able to see that, that this is happening, that there is a direct relationship between these forces. Yeah. And I mimic this in miniature versions of pyramid technology and other techniques people are sharing in our electroculture beginners to advance Facebook community, which uh, we can, if it's all right, we add a, add a little link down in the description. Definitely. Um, and 200,000 followers and more growing strong. It's wow. amazing. Almost 200,000. Yeah. It's in, in a matter of, of a couple of years, it's like something just like, COVID happened and suddenly everybody on the peripheries <laughs> who, yeah. who, who didn't follow the same paths were like, okay, it's time for new, new ways of thinking and everything is now on the table and mm. curiosity is there and let's mm. experiment and see what's possible. And I think this is, it's the moment. We, we, it needs to be the moment for this stuff to come to the light. Yes. Because we're, we're in a crisis, you know, we, like, we yeah. are on the verge of potential mass famines. I hate to say it, but the global order as we know it is starting to shake. We're seeing the like the cement edifices are starting to get cracks and fissures. Mm -hmm. And an old way is on the way out. And unfortunately, historically, when these transitions happen, there's usually a lot of disruption, a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. But I, I think... We can, we can change that. And in the realm of food, um, given the results we're seeing with some of this technology, in some cases, 30% greater yield with something that's very simple. Mm. Greater vitality, as you mentioned, like greater vigor in plants, then there's the potential here that we can, we can hopefully shift certain trajectories and this yeah. is this is why I'm, I'm i'm coming out of the closet so to speak because i feel like i feel like this message has to be spread because mm. the implications if it isn't is huge mm. and if nothing else those who are listening and are getting excited about the potential of these forces for growing high vitality food and regenerating ecosystems and harmonizing themselves with their homes, their landscapes, creating sacred space, mm. um, amplifying alpha brainwave activity, um, redirecting Schumann energy frequencies in a localized area, um, mitigating electro smog, you know, all of these things that the invisible rainbow you know i can quote the book um all of these 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 forces it's it's 
it's often been about what, what can we be afraid of as opposed to what can we do to mitigate and not only mitigate, but actually um, transmute. Yes. And, and the bit that you were talking about, Ray, with mm. feeling and the passion that you have about the sacred aspect of it, the honoring, the sort of, you know, the things around the periphery you've been talking about, because yes, there will be the straight linear journey that science will go through to, so, you know, telluric currents are recognized, you know, some, some different types of energies in the dowsing community, perhaps we might be familiar with and sort of able to converse on certain levels about we we can do experiments with energy that we can sense the subtle energies let's say and hopefully those things will come together more and more and hopefully with the work that you're doing with this community and, and with electroculture and just just how how you are recognizing the the patterns here the connections mm. the possibilities and also honoring nature all the way through mm. how can mm. we you know a lot of us feel a bit a bit separate from nature you know especially if we're in an urban environment we can do a little bit right in any of our rooms with a bit of a window we can do electroculture we can reconnect with how to feel magic about growing mm see see these these lovely results and actually maybe i wonder if this is me supposing and guessing if something is thriving because our intention combined with magnetism and natural uh, electro sort of currents that 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 can be running the earth or we can use elect electrical sources as well maybe less water might be required as well or maybe we well, operationally support the water too mm -hmm. to make it even more nourishing and whole. You know. Yeah, I mean the the water element. There's an entire entire <laughs> world of possibility around water. Oh yeah. And you you were pulling on a few things though. I was hearing people feeling disconnected, isolated. There are many people listening who might not have access to a garden. Mm. They don't have the luxury that I have of a homestead. Mm. You might dream of it, and I hope you achieve that. Mm. But many people, and most people, in fact, are living in apartments, are disconnected from the earth. And there are many people who want to reconnect with the earth. Yeah. And I want to touch on that in a moment. But before I do, as you're speaking about water and consciousness, and these other phenomena, I want to tell you a story. Can I, can I tell you a story when I was uh, yes, in my early please. 20s? I would love to hear so, it, Ray. Thank you. This is this is one of those formative experiences that I kept in my back pocket for years. And it wasn't until only recent that I started to discover what had happened and what was likely some of the phenomena at play. So this is really cool. I, I was... I, I was a quester, so to speak, right? I was, I had long hair. I was, you know, cliche hippie. And uh, I was on, you know, a wanderer's path. And I was, I was lost. I was meandering. And I, I had this feeling that like, I knew that I, I had to do something for the earth, right? I had to connect back and support life. And I didn't know what that was. And I also had this deep pain inside of my heart, like like feeling like everything around was broken. Mm. And I didn't feel like I fit in. And I had this lingering sadness. Um, and I came across a community of people who were doing a ceremony um, in a teepee. Yeah. Called the it was called the Native American Church, which is linked with Navajo, Navajo Indians in the um, uh, south southwest, the yeah. um, four quarter states, um, 
with some new age elements, some Christian elements. It's very bizarre when you think of, of the way cultures intersect. But this ceremony inside a teepee with the use of um, peyote in small quantities as a stimulant to stay focused and awake. Yeah. All night chanting inside the teepee, indigenous prayer songs with intention as an individual and as a group. And what happened in this experience, it was insane. This is going to come right back to water. Okay. This was on an equinox. Okay. And adjacent to the TV on the property was this pond. And it was a healthy pond. There's nothing wrong with it. But collectively, we had the main intention of focusing on water. Because the water element, we, we felt, and I still feel, is the, if you were to take the five elements, is the element that we need the most right now. Right? We need the balancing of the water against the fire. And we're, we're doing this ceremony, and we're chanting, and we're praying. And some people are... are are vomiting from the from the peyote it's a purifier mm. there there's some discomfort there's a lot of cathartic energy happening and in the center of the teepee there's this beautiful fire that's been slowly been the ashes have been used to create a crescent moon and the opening of the teepee is facing east the rising sun and at dawn as the sun penetrates through the teepee mm. it pierces the center of the fire of what remains and what happened was extremely bizarre so imagine this we're still chanting and the sun is starting to enter in and as if out of nowhere we could hear this audible pulsing hum that was spinning, vortexing around us inside this teepee, going clockwise. And every time it would pass through the ear level of the head, it would make this. And it was accelerating until it raised itself up and shot out of the top. Now, some of you listening might think that this is maybe hallucinogenic. It did peyote after all. If it was, it was a group, group hallucination because everybody around me was experiencing the same thing. And if that was only an isolation, I would denounce it and say, well, leave it to skepticism and be done with it. But when we left that teepee, mm. I, I have never in my entire life seen so much dew, moisture, droplets on everything. Everything was alive with, remember the original intention, purifying the water. Everything was bubbling with water. There was this lightness, this weird mist that was just floating off the ground. It wasn't fog. And we went over to that pond. And being in my early 20s with the younger ones, we, as you do in such situations, you know, we had fasted all night, all day prior. We just took off our clothes, jumped into the water. Yeah. And that water was bubbling with oxygen so much that it was like it was salt water saltier than the ocean and it was fresh water and i was floating like I, I was buoyant levity wow and i just i remember my eyes just being fully open and i'm like just bathing in this incredible experience and thinking to myself what is this magic what what did we just do as a group? Right? Just through the power of prayer and intention and love, like it, it, and and I have a very analytical mind as well. 
-hmm. my heart is open as best as I can. But immediately after that, I'm thinking to myself, I need to know what this is. What is this? Why is this? And I don't have all the answers, but I have some. And it comes full circle back to what we started the conversation about. Electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the electroculture piece, right? Mm -hmm. Earth energy, cosmic energy, yeah. the union of forces inside the geometry of the teepee, 72 degrees, right? Which holds within it, right? The five pointed star it moves the energy upwards. Okay. The vortexing of energy rising upwards through the opening at the top with the fire maker who is preparing the fire perfectly so that there's still consistent smoke, but not enough that it covers us and it moves up, which is changing the the localized electromagnetism, right? It's ionizing the air. Yeah. Right? Having an effect. And then as the sun pierces on that special day, the equinox, the rising, that telluric energy, because when we went from that 3 a.m. of darkness where we are literally at the dark night of the soul, right? Mm. Furthest point away from the sun, yeah. Right. Where the magnetism of the earth is least strong in that moment. Mm. To then the sun rising, where that energy then starts to pulse up to meet the sun, it took our prayers and sent it upwards as an offering. And for whatever reason, had this horizontal effect, right? that influenced the water molecules all around to remain in a state of viscosity. And this is the thing. When understanding magnetized water, magnetized water changes the water into what's called the fourth phase of water. It's viscous. Mm not liquid, it's not solid, it's not gas. It's between liquid and solid. It's a transitionary phase. It's, it's the type of water that bathes our DNA, right? Interesting. And it goes back also to the geometry because the water molecules, they're, they're tetrahedral, right? They're oscillating, they're moving around. And when they connect, right, they then can can amplify whatever whatever magnetism is, right? Or when light hits it, you know, the prism, Pink Floyd, you know, and it, the rainbow goes in a perpendicular oh, yeah. plane, you know, <laughs> fracting. Love a prism. <laughs> you know, all of these things. So I still don't know what what that was about and i'm on this discovery path about trying to figure out how we can remember lost wisdom of the ancients mm. Mm -hmm. how we can utilize modern science but blend it with the humility and the grace of our hearts mm. and it is akin to electromagnetism, electricity in one plane, magnetism in the other. It's the, it's the union. Yes. And it, it is literally our heart. Yes. And plants, you know, what color are they? Same as the heart green. chakra. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're that conduit. And where we are, we are interacting with them whether we know it or not all the time yes so this goes back to the people who are 
maybe inside an apartment or a situation that you know they'd love to change but they feel disempowered you don't need to have a garden you don't need to have you know a homestead you don't need to have a farm if you can get outside and do so in a way that's loving and conscious mm. and present and understanding these principles just by just by your presence alone, you can impact life all around you. Yes. And I see that this is the whole thing, right? Like in our, in our Facebook community, it, it's, you know, 200,000 people. It, it's a, it's, it's a metropolitan, it's a city, you know, mm -hmm. and in a city, there are a lot of diversity. There's a lot of different people with different worldviews and it's just the same in this community. And there's a lot of skepticism to a lot of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. but if you're willing to do your own experimentation your own observation plants are amazing because they give you feedback all the time immediate validation mm -hmm. and if you can start to see the patterns then it can be a consciousness shift because yeah. there's magic there. There is, and it's that co-creation as well. So when when I'm gardening, I I might grow something from seed. I mm. I might douse for what seeds would be beneficial, what would like to grow my garden i will connect with the lunar cycle where's the mm. waxing and the waning whether it's a leafy veg or a root veg when's the most ideal time to plant or to fertilize when i have are ready with my little seedlings to plant them out i will mm. douse for where would they like to go where would be right for for them to well, be you're, you're you're already on it <laughs> look at you so but that's what I do. And and I love working with and tuning in with the elementals sort of kingdom, let's mm. say, which the ancient cultures always knew. You know, they would talk about devas or plants. Devas, spirits. fairies. Yeah, fairies. Yeah. You know, you have you have the the fairy or fey folk or people under the hill, <laughs> you know, leprechauns, whatever characters you have looking after the growing of the plants the growing mm -hmm. energies and then you have the gnomic kingdom looking after the structure the crystalline the sort of and also apparently been hearing about being almost like shepherds for the energy lines that that run through the the planet they they keep them mm -hmm. happy they keep them marshaled and shiny we use them like super highways <laughs> yeah for consciousness right <laughs> like that little dance there right <laughs> so if if i'm doing that so i try to cook consciously source consciously garden consciously be in the moment and love 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 and appreciate and feel gratitude for everything how would i use electroculture mm. to help me let's say, help the plants live their best life and co-create together. What would I do? Because I've seen pictures of pyramids, spirals mm -hmm. in copper, right? And is that the metal? Because it's such a conductive metal. But how would, I, how, would I, how would I explore that? How would I get going? Because I really want to try. I'm so excited. And your storytelling is absolutely so compelling and magnetic. Thank you. I just want to mm. go and play and have fun and experiment. <laughs> well, the gate the gateway to electroculture has been the spiral antenna. Okay, it's been creating a spiral and doing that with a conductive wire, mm -hmm. two to three millimeters mm -hmm. in thickness copper or aluminum, soft wire that you can move, right? 
there are mold, there are molds specific that that are within the Fibonacci sequence. A little 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 insider tip. If you want to start with a spiral, is you take you can use make a circle, right? Yeah. You yeah. take the wire and you start from the center and you wrap it around in two dimensions, flat plane. Yeah. Where every part touches. And then you grab the center and you pull it up and you get your coil. Yes. Great. And the principle of the coil, the spiral, from a scientific standpoint, there are many other, other theories which we don't have enough time to go into, um, magnetic monopoles and various uh, exciting <laughs> rabbit holes. But the, <laughs> the, 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 the easiest way to understand it is that what it's doing, why it's called an antenna, is that it is, it is taking radio waves. And when that radio wave hits the metal, it's releasing electrical current that is traveling down the spiral. And in this case, you run a wire down towards your plant. You can have a bamboo stick, you can have a um, piece of wood. You run that wire down and it's bringing micro doses of electrical current. And that is stimulating the microbial life in the soil oh, nutrient wow. exchange it's increasing the plant's ability to uptake minerals right through its, its proton pumps through its cell cells it's increasing the water holding capacity of the soil with the electrical charge minerals being held in, in soil etc the spiral antenna is the gateway but because you mentioned your focus on the elementals, your mm -hmm. interest in, in the heart, um, mm -hmm. and all of uh, the, the beauty that comes with that, it's mm -hmm. very heart-centered. Mm -hmm. um, there is a large rep repertoire. There's probably easy 20 to 40 different techniques that can all stack together, passive techniques. But the ones that I think are, are the funnest in, 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 in what you've said, one is the pyramid power. Yes. And the other one, because we were originally talking about standing stones or stone circles, mm. it's making, making meneers in a um, somewhat artificial way. Okay. These are referred to as power towers. Ooh. And it is a relatively easy way to go about making a standing stone without having to, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> <result>. One, <laughs> you know, call it. <laughs> Get a bunch of, uh, you know, slaves right <laughs> yeah. um, um that is what i would recommend and with pyramids i would say start out with the giza dimensions which are 42 degree base angle i'm working on a working on a, on a guide for that um, okay. not quite done but if those of you listening if you if you're interested, you can head over. I'll put our website. I'll send it to you. We can hopefully people can take a look if they're interested. Sign up to our uh, email list, and we'll give it to you out when we've got it. But how to build one? It's pretty straightforward. Um, we also have we have some companies we work with who who build them and sell them as well. But okay. using conductive metal as well, in this case copper. Yeah. And creating a four sided pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, many people use it for meditation already. Mm. Um, I like the Giza dimension because that to me has a connection to the heart. I think that there is a relationship. I don't know what it is, but that the Giza pyramid is somehow amplifying our hearts. 
you know, okay. whether it's an electromagnetic field amplifier, you know, the heart math principle of, of, of our hearts emitting fields. And the, the um, power tower is interesting because it's also, it's working as a Schumann wave guide antenna. Schumann resonance, right? That 7.8 something hertz to 12 point something, I, I don't recall, but it's, it's, the, it's the ELF radio wave bandwidth. You know, these are like radio waves that are kilometers long. Okay. It's the, it's the Earth's natural um, pulse, so to speak. We're, we're blanketed in this because of um, the el electricity in the atmosphere that's coming down and lightning and it's creating this these, these radio wave emissions that then get trapped because of our upper atmosphere, hold them in. Um, this, is, this is interesting because these are all connected to our heart. Right, like when we, when we're in an alpha brainwave state with our mind, yeah, we are we are we are at that that hertz, right? That number of oscillations per second range of mm. the human residence of the Earth. The problem is, is we're we're disrupting that, um, and in many many New Age circles, many people will say. The Earth is raising its vibration. You know, we're upgrading all of this stuff. I mean, I personally, I don't want to be dy dystopic, but I'm not convinced that the increases in the Schumann resonance is a is a net positive. You know, I I think it's likely an imbalance um, atmospherically due to cutting down fifty percent of the Earth's forests, natural antennas. Um, conduits for electrical energy from the atmosphere. It's um, a combination of um, satellites and uh, electro smog and these mm -hmm. things and ripping out natural materials from the substrata of the earth that have balancing effects in ways we don't comprehend, right? Precious stones. Absolutely. Be wonderful in our, in our temples and our homes. Yeah. Yeah, they have they have a function. <laughs> that that you may not know what those are in the earth. But they have a function, and as we yeah. go into the Anthropocene and we create these disruptions, we need to mitigate. We need to learn from our mistakes, and we, then we need to balance. Mm -hmm. And these standing stones, artificial standing stones, are a way to do that because naturally, it is a acting as an antenna human resonance and it's amplifying it in a localized area and you can visually see the effects on plants wow which is amazing which is our feedback this is our which feedback, is our feedback. For, for the let's say invisible and or subtle energies that people some of us can feel just you know, we can sense we're sensitized, let's say we can feel these these feelings. So when you were talking about, let's say, the the effect that mining or you know, doing things to to the earth um that may not be beneficial for the harmonic frequencies resonance um around us when i've driven on a motorway um that's like a freeway through a place which has a big hill that's been cut into quite significantly mm. in order to help the road go straight or you know not go like that <laughs> um i do feel i do feel like there's a gap and the earth energies that hitherto had run under that hill in let's say a bit like earth energy train lines or you know that kind of equivalent where you have places you know the lines the energy lines go from one place to another they can undulate they can sort of mm -hmm. go and go in whatever path they they go in 
but when it feels like that's been severed energetically i've been called to join them together to re-patch them up it's almost like a stitch them yeah yeah because you can you can do this you can help you can balance and rejoin with your intention and with your open heart um and and wanting to be of service you you can you can feel the energies and you can feel them being made whole again because they it feels like there's they just don't know how to re-tether uh, and just just by intervention you can do this and mm. the like you've been saying about men here and and the the generative power of the spiral it's it's quite powerful isn't it it's a limitless thing if you let a spiral keep on spiraling when's it going to end it's not going to end it's just going to keep on going <laughs> um because there's yeah, no maybe. there's no there's no full stop there's no um gate is there to stop the spiral expanding and it depends it dep i think it depends on its 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 dimension you know if it's if it's moving as a corkscrew ah uh, yeah that does yeah. that does seem rather infinite if it's um you know because th this is the thing that uh, i i rarely i rarely say because there's often never a moment to do it but the spiral as a symbol is in, in electric culture is is really special mm. because the the tip of it the tip of it right from the top but then each of the concentric rings began to get wider. The tip of it is a nexus. It's, it's the it's the initial start. It's like the the point from nothing to something. Mm. And when you think of the Fibonacci sequence, right? Mm. Like the one, two, three, and then three and two become five, mm. five and three become eight. It is birthing from what came before it yes but conceivably there is there is a nexus point where energy is entering in to the material world from the vacuum right mm. free energy yeah some form whether you could call it organ whether you call it g or prana mm. you know and there, there are different nexuses, whether it's in the center of a sun and you've got the fusion reactions, you know, and the hydrogen gas moving through galactic filaments that are pulsing, connecting suns together that are allowing the reactions to occur, or whether you have a nexus point at a geospiral that you douse in your backyard where there are intersecting currents that then unite in a nexus and rise out of the top. There are all these points, these central points metaphorically of circle mm. that are all interconnecting. And for me, philosophically, this, this, is, this is the interconnected web of life in, it, in its greater, greatest beauty. And our heart, our heart is a nexus, mm. right? So that intention that you're setting to stitch and to repair, it's as if you, you, are, you are bringing creative energy from God, right? The creation source, whatever you want to call it, you're bringing it into the world. You're starting from that, that zero in the Fibonacci sequence as you move out and from, from nothing becomes something, but it becomes from chaos becomes harmony and order and geometry and form take shape and life emerges, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I find it all very, very beautiful. And, and what you're saying here, it's really empowering because you, know, if you go out and you look at the postmodern landscape of cement and, you know, phallic skyscrapers shooting up into the sky you know, yeah. ugly cement blocks. I mean, yeah, it doesn't speak to the soul. No. It 
it makes sense to some people's minds and pockets perhaps it mm. i i find in particular brutalist architecture is really tough for me to aesthetically imbibe i kind of mm. want you know there's some places in in london near the river thames that are quite iconic for that era and it's just concrete and and the the way the water just sort of stains it it just feels like there's weeping going on and it's just Mm. like it's so far away from that beautiful fibonacci spiral the way the cosmos expands the way that nature grows and there's so many of us it's anti-life Mm. fundamentally mm. it is anti-life mm. it, is, it is it is why communist era architecture which was removing our connection to anything sacred yes putting the focus on the state right collective mm. channeling that that human psyche that energy into, uh, into mm. artificial power that instead of instead of worshiping the creator were worshiping our creation, so to speak. But yes. then in the process, we're creating the most ugliest landscape that you could potentially imagine that is the grayest, dullest, lifeless, soulless, void, nihilistic, empty feeling. And we're living in it. We're in, we're in this like postmodern period. I feel like we're in a dark age, you know? And that's why it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot a lot of these points that we're discussing for certain people for little light bulbs to go off and go, Oh, wow. Yeah. I I don't have to feel this way. (laughs) Absolutely. And what you're talking about, Ray, through your connection with your heart and your expansive sort of explorers mindset and, and philosophy that, you know, you can do good for the planet it's mm. it's creating an inner golden age this sort of inner alchemy that you're you're instilling in yourself you know the way you've gone from farming to simplifying with homesteading it's more mm. human scale it's more human friendly isn't it and and you know you've been gifting things to your community that's you know an energy exchange and and i'm sure mm. you'll receive things back because I'm feeling drawn to energy exchanges and almost bartering, like I'll exchange my gifts and skills Mm. of what I've been put on this earth to be and to share with others. And let me receive things that you have to share with me. And and that feels like a really harmonious, like, you you know, the opposite of what you've been describing. Yeah, it feels like that's our golden age. There's no stickiness to it. There's no unspoken resentments or in in imbalances it's absolutely because it's given with love and also the body knows when the energy balance is in place Mm. know that equilibrium is there Mm. and and it's it's giving with love and receiving with love um it's like the sacred cacao ceremony it's Mm. really really beautiful so I just I want to say thank you for doing the work you're doing, Ray. It's phenomenal. Mm. I am so inspired. You had that incredible, you're already awake by it, right? But you had that awakening experience in the TP that you 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 weren't lost anymore. You you had a path to follow after that experience. I did I did fall asleep for a while. <laughs> but you know we we all go through phases of growth and sleep mm-hmm. nature has to expansion contraction yeah i've been i i've had a good few years of plateau feeling spiritually you know and it's just it's mm-hmm. normal and i did check in and just say is this okay I'm just like going through the motions of life a bit. And yes, being a as good a person as I can be, you know, full of loving kindness, but I'm not doing walking the walk, let's say, as, as much as I would like to. And mm. I kept getting the answer, yeah, it's fine. You just do what you're doing, go through what you're going through. Accept yourself. Mm. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you. I, I, I was really, really happy to have you reach out and have this conversation. And I feel like there are many, many points we could still go down, but. Um, oh yeah, loads. I've got, I've got, so, you know, when you have a cartoon character, lots of ideas. I've just got so many little sparkles going around, right?